The following lesson is from CISSP 2008 edition Learn Smart Video Training. To find out how you can get unlimited access to our entire Learn Smart Video Training library, call 1-800-418-6789. Proper security planning is vital to keeping your system secure. You have to know where to start and what steps to take as you move toward a more secure system. The first step is to identify what you're trying to protect and then respond to the threats that you uncover. So let's take a look at several ways that we can get started towards proper security planning to make your system more secure. One term you're going to hear quite a bit is information security management governance. Now, it's a fairly new term, but it describes a large body of activities that have been around for quite a long time. Essentially, it is the assurance that appropriate security activities are being carried out. In other words, it's just the proof that you're doing what you need to be doing. It ensures that security risks are being reduced. Now, remember that to reduce security risks, you first off have to identify the risks which means that you have to identify what is at risk. Then you implement controls to reduce these risks. Now, any time that we reduce risk or we implement controls, we're going to have to expend some budget. So governance also ensures that your security budget is properly being used. Now, there are many different definitions for what InfoSec management governance actually means. In the IT Governance Institute, has their own definition, which is a structure of relationships and processes to direct and control the enterprise in order to achieve the enterprise's goals by adding value while balancing risk versus return over IT and its processes. Yeah, it's kind of a mouthful, but it summarizes what governance is all about. In order to implement InfoSec management governance, it's important that we start not from ground zero, but with some sort of framework more and more we see that compliance requirements make us follow more and more individual steps to ensure and to document the fact that we are indeed compliant with whatever agency or regulatory uh, requirements have been put upon us. So we have several frameworks that are out there that help us get started. First, the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations of the Treadway Commission, also referred to as COSO. Well, COSO defines five basic areas of control. It's not important that you know all of the details of the internals of these frameworks, but you have a basic idea of what each one is. COSO defines five basic areas of internal control and are very useful in meeting the Sarbanes-Oxley or SOX Section 404 compliance. Another framework is the ITIL, the IT Infrastructure Library. It was originally designed by the British government stationary office, so it's very much an international structure or international framework in use in many, many different areas. It started off and has grown to be an all-encompassing best practices for IT service management, so it's a great place to start. In addition, we can also look at the control objectives for information and related technology, also known as COBIT. It came from the IT Governance Institute. You remember the IT Governance Institute from the definition of governance. It defines an overall structure for information technology control. And last but not least, now this list is not exhaustive, but these are the big players. But we see ISO 17799, also BS 7799. Now these, these uh, complementary frameworks originally came from the UK Department of Trade and Industry and they were the Trade and Industry Code of Practice and they are the basis for developing security standards and security management practices. So any of these frameworks give you great starting points where you can implement the, the parts that apply to your organization to help you develop an entire governance structure. For security administration purposes, it is crucial for an organization to understand that management is responsible to ensure security. It's not up to the IT staff, it's up to management to ensure. Now, of course, the IT staff and many other people are going to implement the plans, but it's up to management to take the responsibility first and foremost. Just as in any project, solid security administration is always implemented from a top-down approach. What that means is it starts at management, and it filters down. The opposite of this would be a bottom-up approach in which the IT staff or security administrators would dictate overall security policy. 
You don't want that to happen. It's always got to be top-down, upper management, all the way down to the ground floor. Next, it's important to take a look at security goals. There are different types of security goals, and each one addresses a different time horizon. First off, there are strategic goals. Personally, your strategic long-term goals would be something along the lines of what you want to do in the future. Perhaps you have this great vacation in mind. A company's security long-term goals or strategic goals would have the same time horizon. It may be several years down the road. Where are we going to get to long-term? In the middle, we have tactical or medium-term goals. Medium-term goals are probably more oriented towards additional product lines or existing product lines. How do we want to take a product through its life cycle? What are the security implications and what are the goals we want to implement throughout this product line? And then there are operational or day-to-day -day goals. Now, these are the goals that we tend to think of most often. These are maintaining access control, making sure that your firewall is up to snuff, making sure that only the appropriate users can get into your system that you want to get into your system. Those are the type of goals. A good, solid security policy should address all of these. Also, you want to take a look at organizational requirements. Organizational requirements deal with the specifics of what type of organization you really are. You need to understand your security requirements as opposed to anybody else's. Learn the theory, apply it to your own business. For instance, commercial requirements differ greatly from government requirements. Typically, now there's going to be some overlap, there's going to be lots of areas where they do agree. However, in general, commercial requirements focused on integrity and availability. Now you recall of the three triad CIA, I've left out confidentiality. Does that mean commercial organizations don't care about confidentiality? Absolutely not. Some do. Some focus exclusively on confidentiality. But if you think about what a commercial venture is all about, the basic idea is to make money. So what they want to be able to do is make sure that their system that supports their making money can be trusted and is always available. So that's why commercial requirements tend to focus on the integrity and availability tenets. On the flip side, government requirements tend to focus on confidentiality. Anytime you deal with a government entity, you're probably going to deal with confidentiality issues. That's because government entities tend to store more confidential data than any other types of entities. Yes, integrity is important, and availability is often important, but typically we're going to look at confidentiality in the terms of government organizations more so than integrity and availability. Make sure when you're considering your organizational type, the different types of goals, long, medium, or short-term goals, also understand your management style and the organizational culture. When you develop the requirements to ensure security, you've got to make sure that it works for your company. If it doesn't work for your company, then the users that are supposed to be secured by this policy may end up revolting and not following it. So take into consideration all the different nuances that make up your particular company. The first step is to address risk management issues. Risk management is effectively handling risks that can cause loss. Now this is a large topic and we'll move through several different ways that we can start into the assessment process, but looking at it from a very high level, how do I handle risks that can cause loss? Understand where loss can come from. First off, physical damage. Think of all the physical assets that your company uses on a day-to-day -day business to run the business. An organization may have computers, you may have trucks, you may have buildings, lots of other physical assets that are out there, and any of those can be damaged. Sometimes the damage doesn't have to be total, to impact your business. For example, what happens if you lose a backup tape? Well, one backup tape in many cases is not going to hurt anyone. However, if you have not planned well and you only have one backup tape and you lose that backup tape, your loss could be significant. So always consider all of the physical assets, everything that you can touch, and decide how important is it that I protect this from some sort of loss because a loss may occur. Hardware malfunction. Well, we talked about losing a backup tape, and that can happen from several different ways. But what happens if there's hardware malfunction? Let's say that you have a serious electrical fault and the transformer outside your building blows up. Are you prepared to handle that? These are the types of plans that you want to always be prepared for. Hardware malfunction could be something as simple as a hard disk controller going bad. Now, that can be pretty...